Well, I'll go ahead and get started. I expect we'll be being joined by a few more folks, but again, my name is Kate Gleason and I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. We had hoped to be on site and we made the call yesterday with the frost warning from last night and the rain over the weekend. We felt like the site might not be, uh, while it's beautiful and sunny, might be a little cold for what we wanted to do today. So we tried, uh, we kept everybody in the comfort of their own homes, but we do have a great panel here today. Um, we decided to do this program, a, a just basically a free for all Q and A on spring planting questions for two reasons. Every year we do a spring planting speaker series and it seems like the most popular part of the program is the Q&A that follows a formal presentation. Everybody has their specific question they wanna get answered by our expert panels. With that in mind and with the great increase in the Kemper Center for Home Gardening's um, Horticulture Answer Service, we've seen over the pandemic, the number of people reaching out to that valuable service at the garden has climbed greatly. In fact, last year, they answered more than 4,000 questions through the Horticulture Answer Service. They took more than 3,500 calls and received more than 2,300 emails. I'm sure some of you in the audience were uh, reaching out to them to get your questions answered. With all that in mind, we thought, well, what better way to kick off spring than just to have, again, a free-for-all with some great experts. So joining me today, uh, we have two folks from the garden, Daria McKelvey and Tyler Prestine, who are both from our horticulture team. And then we also have Tammy Bame from Maypop Coffee and Garden Shop, which is in Webster Groves, and Bridget Thurman from Plan Haven Farms in Oakville. So before we dive in, go ahead, just so you know, use the Q&A feature to get any questions you have. There's no question too big or too small. We're here to answer whatever we can to get you, pl get, get you planting for the spring. But before we do that, I just want everybody to introduce themselves, kind of talk about your background, what makes you an expert in and we'll go from there. So Daria, I'll start with you. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Daria McKelvey, and I'm the Home Gardening Information and Outreach Supervisor for the Center for Home Gardening, which is the building that's behind me in my background. Um, so I oversee our indoor section, which includes our uh, plant doctor services, um, our horticulture answer service, so uh, email and phone, and also um, our gardening help resources online and plant finder database. Um, so I have a um, just a really uh, huge interest in plants. I, I think they're some the most fantastic organisms. So um, I really love sharing knowledge with people about them and, and talking about them. Great. And Tyler? Yeah, my name is Tyler Prestine. I'm also part of the Kemper team, um, but I spend most of my time over in the Door Snooks Children's Garden. Uh, so I work primarily with Missouri native plants, and um, I also do quite a bit of uh, seasonal annual display gardens. So native plants and a little bit of design. Great. And Tammy, you wanna talk about your background and about Maypop? Sure. Um, my name is Tammy Bame. I'm the owner of Maypop Coffee and Garden Shop in Webster Groves. I'm a professional horticulturalist, and uh, we love talking about plants here. There's never a question that's too simple or beginner because none of us are born knowing this stuff. So yeah, happy to Great. be here. And Bridget? Hi, I'm Bridget Thurman, um, manager here at the Oakville location. Um, I was landscaping for about 10 years and then moved to the wholesale side of a business um, and then joined Plant Haven Farms five years ago. Um, we have two permanent locations and a third one going up in Olivet. So wonderful. Yeah. When, it, when is the Olivet location going up? Um, it's currently going up now. We're hoping to be open by June. Wonderful. Great. Yeah. So okay. to be around. Great. Well, I see that um, we've got questions coming in, but before we do that, and I can tell you even some of the questions I see here, I thought it would be good to start with get some of our most frequently asked questions out of the way. I told uh, Daria, I said, I know we're going to get questions on hydrangeas because that seems to be one that always even comes. People on, call the membership line asking us about hydrangeas. Clearly, we have no answers for you, but we quickly do a transfer. But what are some other, Daria, if you want to kind of lead us through some common questions and then to the whole panel, maybe each talk about what are the questions in whether you're on the industry side or obviously here at the garden that you tend to get. So go, let's go through um, the most frequently FAQs and we'll get those answered out of the way. 
Yeah, so about the hydrangeas, that's one of our most frequently asked questions. Um, it's mostly due to why isn't it blooming correctly? Um, generally, that's because uh, one of the most commonly grown ones is the hydrangea macrophylla or big leaf hydrangea. Um, either it, it blooms on what we call old wood. So it sets its buds. This year's 2022 buds actually were set last year. And generally what happens is either you prune it too early uh, in the winter time and that ends up cutting off the flower buds for this year, or um, sometimes with our weird weather uh, in the winter time, we go from you know up and down quite a bit and the buds come out of dormancy, but then they also get damaged by winter temperatures. So um, there's a comp those two factors can play as to why your big leaf hydrangea is not blooming. Um, some of the, uh, well, the remedy for that too, if you need to prune your hy that hydrangea, you wanna wait till after it flowers. That way you reduce uh, cutting off your bu those buds. Um, some of the other questions we get um, is when is peak bloom at the garden? Uh, generally we say that the last week in April, first week in May is kind of the sweet spot, but of course that's, it just depends on the weather. Um, but right now we have a lot of things in bloom. Um, like our tulips right now are kind of at their peak and also our crab apples uh, are blooming. The azaleas have not come out just yet. Um, they're, they're starting to show the buds, but not quite. Um, one of the other questions, we get a lot of tree questions and um, people looking for references for how to uh, have, find a good arborist. And so we always recommend contacting someone through the St. Louis Arborist Association. They are a listing of certified arborists um, and you can, um, they each have, the companies diff have different, um, uh, you know, services. And so you can go to their website and look at their roster and see which company would meet your needs. Great. And a question, I already see one just on the hydrangea topic. What about transplanting uh, hydrangeas, particularly Kathy, one of our uh, attendees is asking about Annabella hydrangea, how you transplant plant that. Yeah, actually spring right now would be a good time because the temperatures are still cool if you need to move it or also um, the fall also. You don't want to move that during the summer. It would add undue stress on the plant. Okay, what's the latest in the spring would you recommend transplanting it? Probably about mm, May. Okay. Because Late May, we start getting into summer weather, and as soon as June hits, temperatures skyrocket. Wonderful. Well, good. And Tyler, what about you? What are some frequent questions you, you tend to get, either through your work or when you're on the children's garden grounds? Or Yeah, yeah and I just add to the, the hydrangeas, uh, be generous with, uh, you know, don't just start digging right right by the, uh, the base of the shrub. Go out so you can get a lot of the roots and, uh, yeah. It Set and I guess up. that's probably true of transplanting most plants. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, what so about you? Questions? Uh, I mean, right now everyone's wondering, oh, it's 30 degrees. Are my tulips still going to be okay? Um, you know, tulips and a lot of bulbs come from the mountainsides of like Turkey or Iran, the Middle East, Asia. So they know a thing or two about cold. So enjoy the blooms and, and they'll be okay. Um, I get a lot of questions on Missouri native plants, Midwest native plants. What are some of my favorites? Well, I guess the thing with the native plants is you plant it and the wildlife, they'll find it. Um, your milkweeds for the caterpillars and the butterflies, liatris for uh, the butterflies when they're migrating um, south in the fall. Um, but never, don't forget about grasses. Uh, as far as design with native plants, um, I, I like to have maybe a, a third of the design with shorter grasses like prairie drop seed and little blue stem. That'll really hold your design together in the winter. Um, yeah, there's so much to choose from, sun or shade. Yeah. Well, good. Well, 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 I'm sure we'll get some more questions on natives. And I know Tammy and Bridget, just from my own experience, work a lot with natives. What about you guys though? What are your top, you know, come, come, come the next few weeks, come May or June, what are your top questions that you get from uh, shoppers? Uh, Tammy, you want to start? Sure. Um, because we're open year round, we get a lot of questions on uh, houseplants yeah. uh, for now. Um, going into the season as it's starting to warm up, uh, people want to know when they can start putting things outside. Um, the, the biggest Safety um, temperature is probably going to be 50 degrees at night. If you want to put things outside that are kind of tropical, 
Um, there are some cool season um, annuals and, and vegetables and things like that. Um, um, and so uh, we're right at that transition point now, but watch for 40s and 50s at night for safety. Yep, great. And Bridget, what about you? What, ten, what tends to be on the minds of uh, Plant Haven shoppers? So uh, the last couple of weeks, it's when can I plant my begonias and impatience. Uh, yep. um, you know, we just try to tell everybody just be a little bit patient um, and really watch the weather. Um, you really have to make sure they're covered or bring them inside or keep them well protected. Um, and a lot of people are looking for deer and rabbit resistant plants. So what are some good recommendations on those? Um, lavender, catmint, yarrow, um, a still is a good one, salvia, helleborus, um, hardy geraniums. So there's a, there's a lot out there. Great. Well, questions are rolling in and I'll say the, um, the idea of deer resistance and just kind of pests in general, it seems like a, many questions are coming in. So I'll just kind of dive right in. The first question asks, do any of your plant doctors have recommendations for avoiding the destruction of moles in my native garden? What kinds of things can I do to keep them away? So who wants to tackle the mole question? Um, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, at Maypop, we're located right next to uh, a park, one of West yeah. Grove's parks. So we do get a lot of moles in our display gardens. And since we don't want to use pesticides and poisons and things like that, we um, take the time to just go through and stomp down the runs. And we found that after about a week or so of doing that, they get as frustrated as we do. <laughs> and so they, <laughs> they go back out into nature. Oh, that's a good tip. Daria, what about you? What do you recommend when that question gets answered from your callers? Um, we actually have... a. I was going to point to a resource we have online. Our, um, if you go to our website, gardeninghelp.org, we have a lot of uh, pest and disease and uh, pages. And so we have a full profile on moles and some options to get rid of or to deal with them. Um, uh, and I didn't know about the stopping down the run. So I, we might have to add that <laughs> one to our profile. What about uh, uh, asking for a personal? What about chipmunks? I, this is like the first time I live in, this, in South City and I've been seeing more chipmunks than usual. Anything you can do for chipmunks that you know of? I, I'm not no. sure. We, we really don't see, you see chipmunks running around Kemper and the children aren't all the time. They don't really do much damage. They're not like squirrels or moles. Uh, they're, they're little tall, their holes are so small. Um, yeah, they shouldn't be worried. Yeah, they're just so cute, I guess, enjoy them. Okay, okay. <laughs> they're kind of so, cute. To, to get back, we have some questions about some trees. Here's the one. My 16-year-old maple tree only has new leaves on about one-third of the tree. Help. What can you recommend for that, a 16-year-old maple tree? Uh, so that one, I would say, um, it's only got a third. Maybe look closely to see if there's any, you know, damage to the trunk, or maybe there could be something going on with the soil that's causing, you know, one-third to die out. Um, if it's serious enough, that's when we usually recommend calling an arborist, um, especially for the larger specimens, because, um, you know, I can, we can only see or talk about so much on, in terms of the, um, the tree itself, and maybe an arborist can assess that there might be something else going on with the landscape. Um, so that's something we usually recommend. Okay, great. Um, along the, the lines of this, this is more about some, as you mentioned, Daria, getting a lot of questions about what's happening at the garden right now. A couple questions about the cherry blossoms in the garden. Are they still popping? Are they still uh, worth coming to visit? Unfortunately, they have finished up. Uh, I did see one weeping cherry that was still in bloom, which was kind of quite interesting this morning, but most of them have finished. However, the Japanese garden is meant to be enjoyed all four seasons. So now the maples are coming up. So you've got some of the red and green of the leaves and just the color contrast of the new foliage is just gorgeous. And of course, everywhere else in the garden right now is just popping with color. So even if you don't get to see the cherries, now is a great time to come to the garden. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a couple questions about, um, I see a question about some uh, recommendations and maybe some new to the market annuals 
that you can use in the shade. And then the second question about shade is recommendations for ground cover between stepping stones in the shade. So maybe Tammy or Bridget, do you wanna talk maybe about some of your most popular uh, shade plants? And then if there's one specific for uh, ground cover with stepping stones. Bridget, you wanna start? Um, sure. um, so I guess for, um, for shade, uh, you can use, depending on how deep the shade is, um, if you still have some sun, I always recommend um, Creeping Time, because that's okay. always a good one. Um, and I'm kind of stumped here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> stage right. Um, and what, what was the other part of your question? I'm well, sorry. just, and, and Tammy, you might know too, any good just shade recommendations, but then specifically somebody looking to fill in among their stepping stones with ground cover. Sure. Um, we, there's a lot of kind of grassy, but not, in, excuse me, not invasive plants that we like to use in, uh, in shade between stepping stones. Uh, there are some uh, low growing native sedges um, that we like, but I also like there's a, an Ophiopogon. It uh, also does well in dry. Um, called Nana that's really kind of short and so that one uh, is also evergreen um, oh, great. so if you've got if you've got like a little bit of light that would help uh, that would help that but um, if you don't mind if it kind of covers uh, creeping Jenny is really nice because it's that bright color and it helps to brighten up the shade um, and then there's some beautiful uh, ground covers in different colors of ajuga um, that bugleweed that also bloom uh, and have lovely colors like the black scallop contrasts um, strikingly with the creeping jenny so there's some really neat options out there that's great and and tyler what about you what do you use when you are tasked with filling some shade spaces at the garden yeah well if you have kind of a little bit of dappled sunlight uh, i like the uh, native sedum sedum tornadum it gets uh, loaded with white flowers and then if you're in really deep, dark shade, I like the uh, Asarum canadense, the wild ginger. Uh, oh. Kind of like heart-shaped heart, heart -shaped leaves, I guess. They, they hug the ground. That's a nice one. That's great. Good. Well, a lot of questions here on fertilizing. Somebody asked, should you fertilize natives? And what do you recommend for that? No, oh. I, I, I don't do any fertilizing. Um, I'll just add leaf mulch, which is ground up leaves, um, kind of pretend that leaves falling in a forest, they'll decay um, and that'll do the trick for you. Great. Um, and here was another, Tammy, honestly, right as you were answering, what was some evergreen ground cover? Can you say the name of that evergreen ground cover you recommended again? Oh, it's a mondo grass. It's a dwarf mondo grass, um, opiopogon. Great. Um, let's see, I'm going to start just here at the top. Okay, how do I get more blooms on my dogwoods? Anybody have any advice for that? I don't know who wants to take that one, but any advice to encourage more blooming on dogwoods? Mm -hmm. Uh-oh, have I stumped the panel? <laughs> no, it's, it's I think it's the general health of the plant, right? Yeah. You know, like during the summertime, if they get stressed, that's when they're setting the buds through the next year. So um, what, when I see things getting stressed in the landscape is when I notice kind of like the maple that only had a third of its canopy. If it's a red maple, um, a lot of times those get stressed in the summertime and we need to give them some supplemental irrigation. Mm -hmm. um, so that could be a way to increase the health and the blooming. Okay, great. And I see a comment here. Somebody asked if we can type the plant names in our answers. What we're gonna do, I should have mentioned this at the top, we are gonna try and summarize some of our questions and some of the recommendations they give. So we are kind of taking notes on this. We will send that out. So if we have your email address, we will send out maybe not a plant list specifically, but any recommendations that get uh, brought up here, we will include in the follow-up to this. So I have a question here about boxwood blight. It says, I have what looks like boxwood blight that is now on boxwoods throughout my yard. I have not had a lab test to confirm, but I know it's blight. Um, I cannot plant, if it is blight, I cannot plant boxwood for five years, I guess. I, do I need to have this diagnosed? So can you just talk generally, I don't know if that's a question for our, our horticulture team 
about what boxwood blight is and what the home gardener should do if they think that that's um, befallen them. Yeah, um, boxwood blight is, um, it's a serious boxwood disease that affects, um, it, it typically gets into um, some of the younger or really affects the younger boxwood or newly installed boxwoods, um, but it can cause uh, the death of the plant over time. Um, and it's, it's it was seen in the UK pretty heavily. And now we're hearing that, you know, it's here in the States too. Um, I would recommend getting it tested. You can, pro you can send plant samples to the um, University of Missouri. They have a plant diagnostic clinic uh, that just to confirm that's what it is because there are sometimes there are other symptoms of uh, that box would have like, you know, right now we're, we're starting to see some of the um, uh, some of the bronzing from winter, or there could be another, you know, issue going on. So it's best to confirm that that's what it is. Um, and then uh, once you confirm it, you can find ways to, uh, or, you know, remove the boxwood. Um, and we also have a page on our plant finder website for that too. Great. So we'll include that link when we uh, follow up with today's program. Um, We've also a... seen, oh, sorry. Oh. We've also seen this time of year, or it'll uh, take over in a in a landscape and kind of spread is a psyllid wasp that mm -hmm. lays eggs between the layers of the leaves okay. and then that causes those leaves to become discolored and and brown and kind of thin and things like that so there's there's other things that can kind of mimic mm -hmm. the blight. um mm -hmm. so do you recommend tammy to your customers that they get that tested or is there anything visually people can do to inspect to kind of self-diagnose mm -hmm. Um, it kind of, the leaf kind of puffs up, uh, you know, um, be, from, because of the little minor um, larvae that's in it. So I, if they um, contact the Kemper Center, they should be able to um, find ways to, I don't know, do you allow specimens to be brought in or send pictures or? People can send pictures to us. Um, you can send it to plantinformation at mobot.org. It's all plant information is all one word. And um, yeah, the leaf miners, like you can just look at the leaf. Actually, what you could do is even uh, take a, like a pocket knife and cut the lower level or layer of the um, leaf. And if you see little tiny orange larvae inside, that's the, you've got the box with leaf miner. And what's the remedy for that? Um, you, usually you can sometimes prune them, um, strategically to like when, um, probably within the next month or so they're going to emerge and you'll see all these little, they look like small mosquito type insects and they'll fly everywhere. And so, um, you can kind of prune them at that time to maybe prevent because the, the mosquitoes will, or no, mosquitoes, sorry, the boxwood leaf miner adults will lay their eggs in the leaf and you could prune that off so that they're not, um, the eggs are not being set in the leaves. Um, for serious infections, there are products available that can, you can use, but that's kind of more of an extreme, you know, if it's a really serious issue. Yeah. Great. Well, that was helpful. Um, okay. We have a, a question about azaleas and kind of on the subject, if you have lace bugs on azaleas, uh, what's the best non-chemical idea? And then it says, uh, plan to purchase lace wings. How soon is it safe to release them? since it's still cold at night. So a couple questions again about dealing with pests, particularly on azaleas. With the, with the azalea lace bug, I know that one is a little bit more serious um, in terms, of, like there's tons of lace bugs. I've seen them on, you know, like linden trees and everything like that, but they have, tend to affect the azalea, uh, the azaleas a little bit more. So um, they cause some serious stippling. So you might have to use some kind of treatment to really uh, deal with that. Um, I do think, I want to say that they, if you're planting them in sun conditions, they are, those conditions usually a little bit worse than partial shade. Don't quote me on that, but I know that, you know, the location may also help to, uh, um, you know, uh, it, it might depend on the severity or it affect the severity of the uh, azalea lace bug. Okay, great. And any other just general information on azaleas that you tend to get or good, anything you can provide on azaleas in general. I see a couple other questions about that. Just general maintenance, care. Yeah, if you're wanting to plant azaleas, I would say also, um, you know, they typically need acidic soil. Um, here in, you know, St. Louis, our soil is generally alkaline. The pH is above seven. So what you would um, 
best to do is to get a soil test done through um, University of Missouri Extension. They actually have a branch out in Kirkwood and you get your, see what your pH levels are and then you can amend your soil to lower the pH um, so that it's more conducive to growing azaleas. Um, we actually have to, you know, put down a fertilizer, acidic, a uh, fertilizer like Hollytone down to, you know, especially like in the Japanese garden since we have so many. Um, if you're wanting to prune them, uh, wait until after they bloom again, because you would be cutting off the blooms uh, right now. And um, generally, if you do have to fertilize after getting, you know, a soil test done, um, that's kind of best after they bloom. Okay, great. So we do you have a tip? Sorry. Yeah, Tammy, go for it. <laughs> we have a tip for the lace bug. Um, we yeah. Use the horticultural oil uh, or summer oil is, is what it's called because it's not too heavy and it won't damage the plant, but you don't want to do it when the sun's beating down on it. Um, but if you can get like a pump sprayer that has a wand, um, you turn it upside down because it has a little directionality to it and you do it underneath the leaf like this because that's where the lace bugs are hanging out. So usually it's like a couple of applications about two weeks apart, you know, uh, for maybe like a month or so. Um, and then that helps a lot to either knock the population down so the new growth isn't uh, as affected or uh, it can help manage it. Great, and what was the product again? It's a horticultural oil, it's called summer oil. Um, and it's, it's an organic form of control. It's not heavy handed. Fantastic, that's a great tip. Um, Here's a quest, uh, let's see, here's a question about, uh, well, it actually asks, will you have the class on transplanting orchids again? But in general, I don't know if anybody wants to speak to orchids about transplanting orchids. Anybody game to take that one? I'll say like one or two <laughs> things. I, I, I'm not an orchid expert, but um, I do know that with like, you know, like the Phalaenopsis orchids, the moth orchids or the, the ones you get at Schnucks. Yeah. Um, generally those I think are potted after like a year or two, um, or if you needed to bump up the plant, um, you want to wait till of course also after it flowers before doing that. Um, and also you can look at to see if the, the bark medium that it's growing in is kind of broken down. Um, that's kind of generally a good time to do that. So, um, yeah, if, and if you have something like, a uh, it's a paphiopetalum, which is kind of like the, it looks like a lady slipper kind of. I think those tend to like what we call tight shoes. So they actually like to be in, you know, a pot that, you know, you know, fill up, fill up the pot quite well. So uh, it kind of depends on the orchid. So depending on what you have, I would just do a quick search and that would give you a sense of uh, when to transplant it. Okay. And in terms of the class, I'm not sure about that. I will say if, if classes are popular, uh, they tend to offer them, you know, from year to year. So if it's one that's been sold out, I would assume our education team is on it to try and find, to try and find that. So here's another question. Um, somebody said they received a 20 year old eight foot healthy money plant that never had its trunks twisted together. Is it too late? If no, how is the best way to do that? So I don't know who wants to take the, the money plant question. Um, so 20 year old eight foot money plant. I've never seen that one as big as that before. So way to go. I mean, that's awesome. Um, so honestly, I would just try it. If the trunks are, are um, flexible and you can bend it a little bit, I don't know how far you would be able to go down. If, if you can twist it, I say go for it. Um, but at this point at 20, 20 years old, they might be a little too stiff and harder to work with. Um, but I say give it a shot and see how it goes. Tammy okay, would great. do it. Great. Here's another question about uh, transplanting. And I hope I say it right, guys. This is the non-horticulture person. What is the best, when is it best to transplant lungwort? And is it hellebores? Hellebores? Mm -hmm. How do I say that, guys? Who went? Oh, you did it right. Yeah. Okay. Who wants to take that one? Looking for when it's best to transplant those lungwort and hellebore. Yeah, they're they're blooming right now, so I probably just enjoy them for the moment. But like many things, transplant it when it's cool. Um, 
spring or fall. Okay, great. Um, so this is just a general question, but to the nursery owners, so Tammy and Bridget, what are some of your personal favorite plants? So I don't know, if maybe we'll start with, I know we talked about kind of prior to the program as we're heading into uh, porch season, maybe some, what are some of your favorite plants to use in um, container gardening on your porches or anything like that? And then I know Tammy, surrounded by all your, your house plants, some <laughs> of your favorite house plants. So Tammy, I'll start with you. Um, I would say my favorite plants overall are plants that don't require a lot of attention. Once I get home, I get a little tired of watering. So um, one of my favorites right now is, you know, like the Monstera. Uh, it has beautiful leaf, but it, it doesn't get really cranky with me if I forget to water it on a regular basis. Uh, same kind of thing when it's for, you know, like porch pots or um, plants in my garden is I don't, I don't mind, you know, getting them started. And, you know, like getting them established. But once once I do, I I like it if they can kind of take care of themselves a little bit, you know, so things that can handle drying down like begonias or Kimberly Queen ferns or, you know, things things like that. Uh, I like succulents a lot um, out in containers and pots. Um, they can put on a lot of nice growth. Um, so, yep, low maintenance. Great. Well, as we learned, if, if, if you joined us for the Tova Martin house plant, uh, she said no divas in her garden. So it sounds like yeah. you uh, are, you live by that philosophy as well. 100%. Okay, great. And what about you, Bridget? Some favorites from you or from your nursery crew? So again, for the house plants, any kind of tropical foliage, I love like ZZ, Sansevieria's, um, Monstera's, things that really, you know, will tell you when they're ready that they need a drink of water, um, something kind of low maintenance. As far as outside and in containers, um, I like using uh, perennials in my containers because they give you a lot of different textures, a lot of the ferns, um, even echinacea or um, lamb's ear, things like that. Um, so mine, I, I love the color, but I do like a lot of textures when right. I'm putting containers together. Great. Well, we might as well round that out. I was going to say, Tyler, I've got to hear your favorites. Oh, well, there's too many, but one question. I always, uh, I often find myself using this Stratus Canthia Spathacea or Moses in a cradle. Um, people always ask, where can you find it at a nursery? And, and I don't know, it, it's common here at the garden, but is that available at any of your nurseries? Yes. The spiky one? Mm -hmm. So what plant was that again? So the home audience... Make sure they got it. It's a good recommendation from Tyler. The common name is uh, Moses in a Cradle. Uh, spiky uh, leaves, sword-like leaves. They'll purple, yellow, green stripes on them. And then they'll, they get these little uh, cradles with little white flowers in them. Great. And where will folks see those at the garden? Uh, that's a plant that loves the heat and humidity. So in the summer, you'll see it both in the ground and in containers. Great, great. And Bridget Plant Haven carries those? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, so here's a question about a rock garden. Would a rock garden be a good idea for an angled area? I don't know who wants to take that one. Uh-oh, no rock gardeners here? Do you mean like a slope or? I think that's what they probably yeah. mean. No, we, I mean, we, we design wise, I mean, design wise, it's really fun. It just depends as far as plants. It depends on what the, the lighting aspect is. You know, is it a sunny spot? Is it a shady spot? Um, you know, it's um, there's plenty of, of beautiful design ideas out there, whether it would look like a ferny glade or, you know, like a succulent kind of dry um, xeric kind of look to it. And I think a follow-up question from the same person, um, just how do you establish plantings like ground cover or the creeping flax or something else like that, especially on that angled area? I guess, is there anything you need to do when you're growing on a slope specifically, but in general, what's some good practice for establishing ground cover? On a slope, we find a lot of people, a lot of our customers benefit from regular watering, especially the first couple of years until it gets established. Because it's a slope, it takes a while for the water to sink, or yeah, for the water to sink into the soil. So um, an oscillating sprinkler that kind of slowly 
uh, drip, you know, uh, spray the water on is really helpful. Um, and depending on the site, you know, you could need to leave it on for a couple hours once a week. Great. Any other tips from anybody else on that or on just working with ground covers in general? Well, on a slope, I'd, I'd let the plant roots do the work to hold the soil on so you don't have any erosion. So maybe rather than just using uh, bigger pots here and five feet over there, I'd use a whole bunch of plugs to fill up the space and get it going uh, relatively quickly. Great. Um, so here's a question, how to control wild honeysuckle in flower beds? Mm. Who in Daria, you want to dive into honeysuckle? Yeah, that's a, oh, I'm sorry if you had to deal with honeysuckle. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a really, really tough one um, because, you know, cutting it back, um, it will, you know, resprout. So if you can try and, you know, First of all, if there's any suckers getting those up and if you can dig it up as, you know, as, uh, as much as possible, that's also possible. But um, in some cases, if the stand is so thick, you actually might have to use a, a chemical like a, you know, Roundup or something to actually kill the tree itself because it's so resilient, um, which is unfortunate. But, um, you know, as I was talking to somebody else about this the other day that, you know, um, the economic impact of, uh, it, uh, honeysuckle is even worse if you let it sit, you know, stay there and not take care of it. And if it gets to that point, I, you know, thick trunks, I cut it off and immediately you can almost just take a paintbrush, dip it in the chemicals and smear it on your the trunk, um, but do that quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Tammy and Bridget, I'm sure you guys get questions about honeysuckle from customers. Uh, pull it as soon as you see it. Yeah. You can. Yeah. Um, and again, cut it down and, and like Tyler said, paint it with some um, chemical. Just try to, to kill it as fast as possible. Okay. And then another question uh, about nutgrass in flower gardens. I'll be honest, I don't know what nutgrass is, but somebody asked how you get rid of nutgrass in flower gardens. Uh, there's a couple of ways that, that you can do it. Um, there's, there's a selective chemical out there um, that kills just carex, but it could also kill ornamental carex, um, which is a grass kind of thing, uh, kind of plant. So you just have to be sure to know what you have. Um, we like to not use chemicals if possible. Um, so you could, it would have to be a very large extraction kind of process and, you know, digging it out um, to get all the little nutlets. That's why it's called a nut grass. It's easy to pull, but the little nuts are under there. Um, I did get a tip from a, a native seed grower that there is a native plant, um, Verbena histata, that will choke out nut grass. So if they've got a field where they have a lot of the nut sedge growing, um, they'll plant it with Verbena histata and that will choke it out. Okay, great. Um, here's a question, um, how to care for a 26 year old Japanese pencil holly. It has a lot of dead branches and brown leaves. Anybody know that or a specific to help with that? Hmm. Japanese pencil holly, uh, did we stump you again? This might be one we'll do some research on. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> Thinking on the, the matter of trees, what about a good time to cut back a lilac tree? Uh, after bloom. Yeah. So kind of what we've learned. I, I've mm -hmm. kind of learned something today. After the bloom, it's okay to cut it back. Any recommendations just for pruning in general that you can give? Um, I don't know, Tyler or Daria, if you want to take that question. Sure. Yeah, like, um, it's, all, it's always important to know when your plant blooms because that will give you a hint of when it's the best time to prune. So if it's blooming, you know, like your dogwoods or early spring blooming plants, those are likely, they bloom on old woods. So you would not want to put, prune those until after they bloom. But if they're summer blooming, uh, blooming later on this year, um, late winter, early spring is the best time. So about late February to early March before that new growth starts. 
Um, and generally with uh, pruning, we recommend not cutting a plant back more than a third in a single season. Um, so that way you don't stress the plant out. So now of course, if there's a, any dead you know, limbs or anything like that, that can be pruned at any time. Or if there is something that is a hazard, you know, you know, it's in the way or uh, causing a problem, then that should be addressed as well. But um, yeah, those are just some quick t uh, pruning tips on those. Great. Um, how about uh, back to kind of deer resistance? So I know we've covered this once, but can you recommend deer resistant container or window box plants for areas with partial sun, sun or shade? Sounds like the deer walk up to their front door and like to get a little look inside, but anything for kind of closer to the house uh, that would be good resistant to deer? I would maybe some um, ostrich ferns or autumn ferns in the in the planters. Do deer tend to not like those? Uh, they're supposed to be deer resistant. Okay, great. Tammy, any other recommendations that you give to your customers on, on uh, deer resistant plants in general? Um, it's a little, shade makes it a little bit challenging. I do like Bridget's ideas of using perennials in containers. And then sometimes you can add just a little something for color, either, you know, like foliage color or things like that. So looking for some shade tolerant, um, deer resistant perennials could be a good way to go. Um, you know, some, there are some colorful grasses out there that could be nice with ferns. Um, there's, uh, you know, the ajugas uh, can trail over the side and things like that. And they typically leave those alone. So there's, a, there's a few options. Great. Here's a question about blue false indigo. Can it be moved before it blooms? For instance, like in the next few days. Anybody want to take a question on blue false indigo? Yeah, that'd be fine. I just take a generous hole around it. And uh, once you transplant it, water it in well, that should be fine. Now's an okay time to do that. All right, another question about some, um, some things we don't want in the garden. How can you eliminate wild strawberry in the garden? Any tips on that? Probably more of the same. <laughs> the past two weeks, my volunteers and I and the children's around, we've been uh, digging them out by hand with our soil knife. So that's one thing, yeah. but that's one plant where you have to be honest with it. If you let it go, it, it will take over. Um, so I guess when you see it, trying to get on it early. Okay, I guess that's that's sort of the name of the game with weeds, I guess. Um, here's another question that we have, you know, obviously a lot of questions about trees. And I think anytime we're talking about trees, a pin oak question usually comes up. Bark falling off 70 year old pin oak. It has galls again and black smudgy vertical passages on the trunk. Uh, how can I do something without using pesticides? This is obviously somebody who feeds pollinators and doesn't want pesticides. Yeah, if, if you've got serious patches on your, or like bark falling off on your trees, that's definitely time for an arborist to assess what the tree, the landscape, and also the life of the tree also. Um, with the, oh, speaking to the pinnacles, that's probably the second uh, most common yeah. question we get. I knew that was coming eventually. Um, the, the pin oak galls, uh, unfortunately, there's not much that can be done for them because of a couple things. So most, there's thousands of galls out there. And I mean, tons that appear on oak trees, uh, just flip over a leaf during the summer. It's, you'd be amazed to see what you can find. And most of those galls don't really cause any serious harm to the tree. They fall off with the leaf and it's part of the natural cycle. The difference between those galls and the pin oak galls is that the galls form around the tree so or the branch so it like can eventually cut off this like circulation uh, water flow and everything to um, the branches and what makes it even more complicated is the life cycle of the insect um, ha has happens in two parts um, so it's very hard to control but it's a it's a native insect and also um, so with Pin oak galls, I mean, most of the time the tree can handle it. Um, the best thing, like we said, with most tree care is keeping it healthy. It makes it um, a little, it can withstand more uh, potential issues. Um, there's really not anything you can actually do to remove the galls. Like you, if it's a young tree, maybe you can prune off a couple, but chances are that there's going to be more in the future. So um, the other issue too also is pin oaks are really not good for, are great for this area. Again, they tend to like more acidic soil. 
and like I said, we're alkaline. So um, that also affects the amount of nutrients they can take, it, uh, take up, like iron is usually an issue. So that can uh, sometimes weaken the trees, making them more susceptible to, uh, it, you know, uh, insect and disease issues. So um, for the pin oaks, it's just keeping them healthy. But if you start to see um, major issues with the tree, then uh, call an arborist and have them look at the tree. Um, sometimes you'll see some squirrels nibbling off the sections of galls and things. That's not too much to worry about. Um, uh, actually, they're kind of doing you a favor by pruning a few things out. Um, but other than that, it's just keeping the tree of the healthy. Okay, great. Well, here's a question I think it's going to be good for Bridget or Tammy, just about um, what you recommend when your customers come in. Somebody says, I get overwhelmed with all the fertilizing options. I have a perennial garden with some shrubs, and they're curious what we would recommend just as a maintenance plan for fertilizing. Uh, sometimes I've put down a 10-10-10 for shrubs, but I also see other things like biotone and things like that. What's just a general recommendations around fertilizing, particularly perennials and and shrubs that are common for homeowners? Um, here at Green Haven, we always use, um, we recommend a nature source. Um, it's made by the Ball Seed Company and it's an all natural fertilizer. So you can't over fertilize and burn your plants. Um, it's good for house plants, orchids, shrubs, vegetables. So it's good for everything. Great, and what about you, Tammy? We always recommend the organics because um, we try to promote the health of the biology of the soil. And when you start using synthetics, then that starts to um, alter the natural, um, the natural microbiology in the soil. So a lot of times there are nutrients and things there. The plants just can't get them because it's not in good balance. And so uh, we recommend compost or a natural organic fertilizer. And when is the best time to apply those for, again, like if we're talking about a perennial bed? Spring. Great. And maybe fall. Yeah. Okay, great. Anything on the, on the fertilizing, Daria or Tyler, that you want to add? No, we pretty much covered it. <laughs> okay, good, good. Okay, well, a couple specific questions. Can a red bud survive a severe cutting? Will it ever get a decent shape back? So again, another question about cutting back a red bud in this case. Hmm. I guess that depends how it was cut. Um, yeah. you're selectively pruning certain limbs or if you're topping it. Uh, but the red buds are usually pretty resilient. So if somebody I maybe overcut, not all hope is lost. Right, yeah. Okay. And here's a question just about herbs. I know if, if, if you tuned in last month, we were at Kitchen Conservatory uh, making a falafel and some other fun stuff with herbs. But can you talk um, about maybe Tammy and Bridget, this is a good one for you, what, your custom, what you recommend for your customers when it comes to planting herbs, maybe in containers or in the garden, just some general um, advice you give? It usually just depends on what they how what they like to cook and what they like to eat. Um, sometimes I'll recommend doing like a salsa container. So you have your jalapeno and tomato and cilantro, um, different kinds of basils. It, it kind of just depends on what they like to use and we um, what they cook with. And then we help them put something together. Okay, what about you, Tammy? Do you guys do a lot of herb sales? We certainly do. It's a lot of fun and there's so many different flavors and things to try. So we like to encourage people to look at their entire landscape as foodscaping. So even if you're doing a, an ornamental, you know, kind of container with some, with some plants in it, there are edible flowers that you could put in um, as well as like some things that trail like, you know, the creeping thyme uh, or some things that are like nice and tall like rosemary. So um, we don't need to think of them as just, you know, something for in the vegetable garden. And what about, you mentioned edible flowers. What are some fun edible flowers you recommend? Oh gosh, there's all kinds of fun ones. There's uh, nasturtium, the, a lot of the begonia flowers are edible. Um, there's uh, pansy flowers, there's violets, and all kinds of fun stuff out there. Great. Um, so here's a question. We've got a couple more questions. Let's see. I'm new to, oh, 
this is an e this is an easy one that we'll just cover and I'll cover for you. This person says, I'm new to St. Louis. Can you tell me again the names and locations of Tammy and Bridget's businesses? So Tammy's at Maypop in Webster Groves. Very easy to find, tucked in sort of the North Webster area. And Bridget, will you go over your locations? I know you have the permanent location in Oakville, but will you talk about your locations again? Sure. The um, Oakville location is at the corner of Telegraph and Hines. Um, we have our farm, which has 21 greenhouses where we grow um, all of our own annual, or, yeah, annuals, vegetables, herbs, some shrubs, um, perennials. And that is in O'Fallon, Missouri off of Highway 79. And that one is seasonal, usually closes at the end of July, beginning of August. And we have another permanent location going up in Olivet, um, right next to Olivet Lanes, um, that hopefully it'll be up and running in June. Wonderful. Well, a couple more questions. We have about 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna try and get through these last few questions. Um, Here's a question about fungus. I noticed fungus growing at the base of my olive oak tree. I Googled about it and the website recommended using a four to one water bleach solution. Is that a good tip? And is there anything else they should do? I don't know who wants to take that one. Daria or maybe Tyler from the garden crew? Hmm. It depends on the type of fungus. Uh, Cause usually if it's like a shelf fungus or coming out, um, that's usually a sign of something going on internally. Um, if it's more like, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if a bleach solution is going to take care of that. There's more to, uh, but more than what's going on in that, in that tree. Uh-huh. So, um, Sometimes we see customers, um, where the, the mulch, like if they use the mulch around the tree, uh, that naturally is breaking down. And sometimes you see the fruiting body of that fungus, you know, that mm -hmm. mushroom, and they think that it's related to the plant itself, but it's really not, it's the mulch. So it would be, it's hard to say without a picture, maybe what's going on with that tree. Okay. And that's the kind of thing, Daria, somebody could send the, the horticulture answer service a picture and you'd do some help to diagnose that. Yeah, we give some ad potential advice. We're, we're not mushroom experts in terms of ID, but we could say like, you know, this is, you know, point you at least in the right direction of where you might wanna, you go with it. Okay, great. Um, so Tammy and, and Bridget, I'm gonna mention you guys because you both mentioned uh, the Monstera. So somebody here has overcut their Monstera. They've put in the cheese leaves and vases as gifts. Now I'm down to the stub of the original plant. What's some advice for getting it back? Just give it some food and put it outside for summer. <laughs> it'll it'll get going. As long as the roots are still there and healthy, it'll be totally fine. And and how long would it take to kind of develop back up? Do you think? I think it kind of depends on how much light and that you're giving it, um, and how much care. Yeah. Okay. I, we're entering the growth season, so it'll start to take off pretty soon. And they love it outside in the summertime with the heat and humidity. That's great. And do you move that when you're moving and any other tips in general for moving house plants outdoors for the summer? Sure. Wait until it's above 50 again and then do it slowly. Like take them out for a little while because they're used to the our indoor temperatures, which are consistently about the same. So yep. you need to kind of acclimate them over several days or like a week or a week and a half, little at a time. Okay, and would you put them to, would you start kind of in the morning or would you put them out kind of in the middle of the day to get them started or? At the most comfortable part of the day. And then you can let them start, you know, like getting used to cooling down or you also want to do it with the light. So you want to start them out in the shade and then start slowly work them into more sunlight so they don't get burned. Okay, and, and should you, I guess, just kind of follow the what the plant likes. If it's a full sun, it can handle the full sun of outdoor summer. Yeah. Yes, but I kind of like humans, you know, you got to get used to it. <laughs> and Bridget, what did you want to add? It's like uh, when we go outside for the first time in the, you know, warm weather and we don't put sunscreen on, if you put, same, you get burned, if you put your plant out in the full sun without getting it used to it, it's going to burn also. And then do you, you bring those back in just again when that temperature starts to dip below 50? Is that the time to bring them back yep. in? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, here's another question, I think maybe from the same person about uh, another popular house plant. 
optimal growing conditions for indoor fiddle leaf fig. Can you, can you, should you prune it, especially when it gets long and gangly? So you want to talk about the fiddle, uh, fiddle leaf fig? Sure. Um, they like a lot of light. Um, they do, they will start to um, kind of stretch for light indoors um, and that can, you know, create some extra long skinny growth, but um, you, there's, uh, it's hard to show without having one here, but you can prune it back and that'll cause it to bush out just very similarly to a tree or a shrub in your landscape. Okay, great. And Bridget, same thing? Just a lot of bright light. Same thing Tammy said, you can, you can prune them back. Great. So I can have a couple questions. I know we don't have our, our orchid society here, but just some general and Daria, I think I'm gonna point this one to you because I'm sure you get a lot of questions on the answer line. General questions about orchid care, type of light, watering tips, et cetera. Gotcha. Yeah, so I'll try and tailor to the moth orchid, Phalaenopsis, Schnucks orchid, you wanna call it. Um, <laughs> Those tend to like, uh, you know, moderate amounts of light. They're the ones that can tolerate cooler conditions con compared to the other orchids. So um, one thing on those, if you're trying to get that to bloom, uh, they do need to, I think towards the fall, they do need to have uh, the temperature kind of drop, you know, um, I want to say between the 50s and 60s, uh, don't quote me on that, but they, they need to a, a, um, have higher temperatures during the day and cooler temperatures at night, and that will initiate flowering. Um, you do want to keep them moist or, uh, you know, provide uh, good tepid water to them. Oh, I will say no ice cubes, please. <laughs> I have a please. specific question about that here in the question. Um, so I'm glad you said that. No ice cubes. It's no, not a good tip. I, I, orchids are tropical. They are not used to uh, cold temperatures. So what you're doing is you're shocking the root system, which could eventually lead to plant death. Not only that, ice cubes are not all the same. Some of them are oblong, some of them are small. It's not going to provide enough water to your plant. So the best thing is to uh, put it under a faucet with tepid water and allow um, the water to, you know, flush all the way out and then um, discard the extra water. But yeah, please no ice cubes. That's, that's not, not recommended. Um, you, the, um, the little aerial roots that are coming out of your phalaenopsis, that's normal. Um, those are anchoring roots. Like they, these normally grow in, in uh, trees. So they're anchoring themselves to the, um, to the plant. And also it, they actually help with moisture retention um, because the, when they're up in the tree canopy, they have to take advantage of all the moisture that they can. So um, those actually will help. You could, you know, put a little moisture on, you know, spray bottle on those if you wanted to, um, that, uh, you know, help, they are able to absorb some, a little bit moisture for through there as well. Um, uh, lighting again, make sure they have good lighting. Um, uh, I think, I think that's any, Tammy or yeah, Bridget, no, any other? A, you, you covered uh, the two questions that came in about the ice cubes. We had two, two questions <laughs> on that. Yeah. Um, um, did you cover fertilizer? I mean, it, they do yeah. have a kind of specific type of um, fertilizer that they use. And they? what do you recommend, Tammy, for that? Oh, uh, we don't we don't carry a lot of orchids because it is a very specialized type of gardening. Um, but there there are really um, uh, they there are some micronutrients that they need, and so there are specific fertilizers for them. Mm -hmm. There's also, uh, we, do carry, oh, sorry. we do carry um, orchids here at um, Plant Haven, and we use a Spoma uh, orchid fertilizer that we sell here. Okay, great. And Daria, any other final orchid tips before we move on to our final questions? Yeah, I was just going to say that you also, if you're, again, repotting your orchid, you want to find a bark mix that is tailored to your orchid. So there's one specifically for Phalaenopsis, others for, you know, different types. So that, you know, make sure that uh, you, you get the one that's right for your orchid. Okay. And what about if, a, if an orchid hasn't bloomed, is, is it possible to get, re, uh, if it hasn't bloomed for a couple of years, will it bloom again? It should, I think it may be just more of a con, con, environmental conditions. Um, so set changing that uh, to what's suitable for that species, then that will help you um, uh, to get that to flower. We actually have a, a updated visual guide on our website on 
uh, orchid care, specifically for Phalaenopsis and a couple others. Great. Well, I think that's, we're right here on the hour. I think that might be a good place to end. As I said, what we'll do is we'll take notes from today's program. We will send this out as a link if anybody wants to watch again. But before I turn it over to Daria to close out with, if you didn't get your question answered, what you can do. Final thoughts um, from Bridget, Tammy, Tyler, just on any good advice as we're heading into this busy warm weather season on planting or anything you want to share with, with the group. We've got about 65 folks still with us. Um, my advice is go for it, experiment with it, have fun, um, mix your herbs in with your annuals, um, just try new things. I mean, if you, you know, it's, there's no wrong answer to it. That's great. Although I think Derry has some right answers, but <laughs> Tammy, <laughs> uh, what about you? <laughs> um, I think, I think Bridget's on the right lines, which is, you know, it's fun. This, this is all about having fun and seeing what happens and trying things out and learning things along the way. If you have some specific questions um, and it's more convenient to go to um, an independent garden center, they're great sources of information. You know, bring some pictures of your yard or some pictures of what your, you know, what your challenges are and we'll do our best and we'll um, uh, you know, try to point you in the right direction. Great, and Tyler? Yeah, well, I guess if you're thinking about garden design, uh, try to remember to think beyond the flowers because the flowers are kind of fleeting, but the foliage you're, uh, you're usually stuck with. So look for plants that have compatible leaf textures with other surrounding plants. That's a great tip. And Daria, why don't you close this out with just a reminder about the fantastic re resource that is the Kemper Center for Home Gardening. Sure. Yeah. So uh, the Center for Home Gardening, it's meant to help gardeners and all their home gardening needs. So um, we have a couple of services available for you. So you can check our website out at gardeninghelp.org. Um, we have plenty of uh, a ton of resources, our plant finder database, which has over 8,000 plant finder profiles. So if you need to know how big something gets, what are the soil requirements, moisture, sunlight, definitely check that out. Um, we have uh, straight species and also cultivars, lots of cultivars available. Um, we also have our horticulture answer service. Um, right now our building is closed due to uh, construction and COVID things, but you can still reach us um, at our uh, phone number 314-577-5143. We we're online um, Monday through Friday, nine to noon. Um, now you can leave us a message and we are a little short staffed right now. And this is also our busy season. So we're trying to work through calls as best we can, but, uh, you know, just please have patience with us on that. Um, you can also email us at plantinformation@mobot.org Um, if you have, uh, send us really good quality pictures. If you have a question about, uh, like plant ID or, uh, that plant diagnosis, um, issue. And also, I just recommend coming to visit the Center for Home Gardening. We have 23 different demonstration gardens. And the purpose of that is to give you guys an idea of what your, you know, what plants you can incorporate into your yard. Um, some of the things that we're, you know, we're experimenting out here. That's what Kemper, I love Kemper because we get to try new things and just, hey, if does it work? Great. If it doesn't, move on to the next thing. Um, you know, come to the garden to see what plants look like up close if you're thinking of, you know, and putting them in your yard. So there's a plethora of resources here that are available to you for free. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Well, thanks again. We will send information out. And thank you for being so flexible as we decided to move this indoors so our, our toes didn't get frozen this morning. But um, just also a reminder, if you haven't yet registered, our next speaker series will be uh, also featuring some garden staff. It'll be um, the We'll go inside the herbarium with Jordan, uh, Jordan Teicher, who is our new herbarium director and curator. So that program will be virtual. It's on May 17th. We'll be back at 11 a.m. Registration for that and future programs is available online. So I thank each of you. Uh, Bridget, Tammy, good luck in the weeks ahead. I know your, your weekdays and weekends especially will be popping here and I know at the garden as well. So thanks to you all for taking time out of your busy schedule and we will see you again soon. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Happy gardening.